And we're back. No, we're good. So, and we're back with uh, to the Crash Labs today. I have uh, a, a wonderful guest and friend, uh, Dr. Quentin Henney. Welcome to the show, Quentin. Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming. And and it, we're we're here at PDAC. It's actually a really nice uh, nice weather for PDAC. Beautiful and very strange to walk around Toronto without freezing to death. Yeah, right. It's off putting, right? <laughs> kind of a little. But uh, in COVID, we had summer PDAC, which was. Was yeah, it's kind of that like was super that. weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like halfway there. Yep. Uh, so, so what's going on? I mean, you're uh, I, I, for our listeners. Why don't you just sort of give everybody a background? How did you get into this business, Quentin? Well, um, look, I, I took an interest in geology when I was young. I uh, grew up partly in Colorado, and my grandfather, who was a farmer down in the plains, right below the mountains, he uh, used to take me up in the hills on the weekends. And I would, uh, we would go prospecting. You know, we'd go to old mine dumps and things like that. And we would, you know, look for, for shiny rocks. I mean, when I was little, anything, you know, was precious at that time. But uh, over time, I learned, you know, to identify gold, learned how to gold pan, things like that. And then about when I was 16, um, there was a small mine operating above the, the hills, you know, just where we lived. Uh, a guy named Tom Hendricks ran it. He was a, a longtime Colorado resident, opened up a small mine when he was young. And um, I called him up one day. I said, you know, I'm out of high school for the summer. I want a job. And he said, come on up. We'll put you to work. He said, we'll put you to work cleaning toilets or something. Really? Yeah. yeah. He gave me my first job. I, I moved into a little cabin that was vacant up there. Had to clean out the you know, it was, it was the a latrines. Mess. Yeah, the latrines. It was a. It, it had no toilet. It was an outhouse, so I had to clean that out. It was a pretty pretty grim start, but it was a lot of fun for a 16 year old. I worked underground for about the first five years. Uh, you know, from high school up through undergraduate. Wow. And um, you know, made enough money that I could get through college, which was. So you were genuinely interested in mining as yeah, absolutely mining mining. Yeah. Yeah, you know, right from a young age. Yeah, that's a phenomenal. I sure did. Yeah, cool. But um, he had a geologist uh, that was working there, and I watched what she was doing, and uh, I thought, you know, that looks even more interesting. You know, going out and chasing chasing right. veins at surface. She's the expert. Yeah, she was a an MSc from the University of Colorado, and she she was his company geologist. So I I started uh, shadowing her on the weekends, just going out in the field and. That's when I fell in love with prospecting and things like that. So I, I kind of gravitated more to the geologic side at that point. Yep. And when I went on to finish my university degree, it was in geology, not not engineering. Amazing. And so and then so you went through for for uh, geology. Um, then um, after that, where did your career take you? I actually finished my degree at the University of Missouri, uh, which isn't really a mining school, but and a good geology program. And um, my wife and I had gotten married about a year before. We actually had our first child right before we both graduated from the University of Missouri. And it was Christmas time when we graduated. It was right before Christmas. And, um, man, I was trying to find a job anywhere, anywhere. I was applying for, for work all over. You know, I applied at Greens Creek. I applied at Cripple Creek, um, all, all sorts of mines. And things were just dead. And um, it was getting pretty desperate. And my wife said, well, if you could do anything in the world, what would it be? And I said, well, I'd probably go to school, at, you know, graduate school at Colorado School of Mines. Hmm. And she said, okay, let's go. All right, so we packed up our Jeep Cherokee with our kid, all our stuff, and we drove out to Colorado. Now, fortunately, my grandmother was living, you know, near there, so we got to stay with her. Um, she, my grandfather just passed away, so she was very... Happy to see you. Grateful us. to have you yes. there and the kids. <laughs> yeah, and, exactly. yeah, exactly. But uh, I went into the Colorado School of Mines. It was the 3rd of January of 1991. And the, it, all the lights were off in the geology department except for one. And I looked down the hall. I saw this one light on. So I walked down the hall, stuck my head in the door. And a, a well-known geologist named Richard Hutchinson was sitting there. Hmm. And I stuck my head in. He looked up and he said, who are you? And I said, well, I'm, I'm a geologist, you know, I'm looking to go to graduate school. He said, sit down, sit down, sit down. I sat down with, with Dick and talked for like an hour and a half. And he said, you're in. I said, well, I haven't taken my GRE. I haven't, I haven't done any of the, you know, the basics that you have to do to get to graduate school. Oh, you don't need to do that stuff. You're good. 
he accepted me on the that's spot. That's amazing. It, it was pretty cool. Yeah. Really? What did you guys talk about? Just <laughs> geology, <laughs> passion, just rocks in general? Well, he, he was uh, you know, you kind of the grandfather of VMS systems. Okay, so okay. It, you know, we talked a bit about what I was passionate about, but then he told me what he was passionate about, and that was VMS deposits. And one of the goals he had in life was to kind of document the occurrence of all different metals in VMS systems. One of them was tin, tin mm -hmm. in VMS deposits. And he said, look, I have a project uh, f that was funded by uh, Falcon Ridge, I believe, uh, to study tin in VMS deposits. Cake Creek, Sullivan, well, Sullivan said X, but you know, you know what I mean. Sure. Massive sulfide deposits. And he said, I need somebody to do this. And I said, well, I'd be more than happy to. So I ended up studying tin in VMS. Oh, so so you guys <laughs> talked about that. You got yep. into like his favorite sort of topic. He had happened to have yeah. this lined up, and then you you were inquisitive and interested, it, and hit it off, and, yeah. and, and away you went. Yeah, wow, that's cool. Yeah. So then, so the, so graduate school. So were you, you were, I guess, a bit of an older student by the time you no, went to graduate no, school, was, or uh, is 20, this was like twenty three, twenty four. Oh, there. okay. So this is butting up against your undergrad, really, at the time. I just finished my undergraduate. Got it. Went into graduate, and and Dick gave me this position, you know, master's um, position at, at School of Mines. And then, um, you know, it, it it still was you know pretty pretty tough to pull things together. So when summer rolled around, that was. So I started in January. By May, I needed a job for the summer. And so I went in to speak with Dick, and he, he gave me a list. You know, this is before emails, right? So he gives me a list of five names. And I can remember all five people. They were vice presidents of mining companies that had offices in Denver. Mm -hmm. And I, I jumped in my Jeep Cherokee that afternoon. It was a Friday. And I went around, and rather than calling people up and trying to set up appointments, I just printed off my resume and went around and started, you know, knocking on doors. And I went through all all five. And the last one I went to was Bill Lindquist at Homestake. He was a vice president at Homestake Mining. And um, I remember it was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I walk in. There's a secretary's office out front, you know, and she's, like, looking at me like, you know, I need to go away. And I said, I'm, I'm a student at Dick Hutchinson's. I want a job for the summer. And Bill Lindquist heard. He had his door open. He stuck his head out. He said, come in, come in, let's talk. In half an hour, I had a job with Homestake. That's <laughs> it awesome. Was, it was truly awesome. So I ended up working for Homestake uh, while I was going to graduate school. That got me through the master's. And then uh, Bill Lindquist actually, when, when Homestake um, decided to move their office to San Francisco, he, he jumped over to Newcrest Mining, which had just gotten started at that point. So we all jumped over with him. So I, I went to work for Newcrest at that point. Ironically, he went back to Homestake later, but you know, I got I continued with Newcrest and then uh, yeah, went through uh, the 1990s, uh, got my PhD, finished that in 96. What did you study? What was your PhD on? Um, it was Neves Corvo. Neves okay. Corvo is the VMS in Portugal. Okay. Yeah, Lundin mines it now. Um, at that time, it was mining. They were mining the copper and the the tin. It was big tin ore body there. So I studied the tin ore body at Nevis Corvo. Ah, yeah. It's kind of a you know a continuation of my work in the masters. And um, I finished that in 1996. And right about that time, of course, Briex happens, and then mm. the gold price starts falling, and everything went to heck. You know, late 1990s. It was it got bleak quick, real bad. Yeah. yeah. Newcrest ended up closing their door, I think, in 1998, and I, I was out of work. I looked all over, you know, n nowhere in Denver could I find a mining company that needed help. And um, it was looking pretty bleak there for a while. Um, but I had three kids at that point, and I had to work. So yeah, yeah, you need to pay stuff. Yeah, I ended up doing various jobs, but I landed a job teaching middle school. I taught middle school for four years. Really? Yep. I didn't know this. That's not what I told you. No, never. <laughs> we, I, you know, we've talked about lots of things and spent lots of time. I, I've never knew, I've known this about you. Yeah. So I had three kids. They were all getting to elementary school age. And the, the public schools were a bit of a disappointment where we lived. All right. Yeah. So they had just started a charter school, which had a, you know, it was a, a better education for our kids. So I went down and I talked to the principal. And I said, look, you know, PhD in geologist or geology, I can teach math, science, but I want my kids to come to this school. 
He said, fine. He accepted all three kids, and I ended up teaching math and science for four years. That's awesome. Middle school math and science. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, you know, that, in some ways, not surprising. Um, I, it was funny when you were, you were mentioning that, because I was thinking about when you said Brex, and then everything went to heck, and there was no work. And the comment I had loaded was, that was a very remarkable time that even, I mean, I obviously got into it later. I, I didn't get in, start at my start until about 2005. But at that time, um, I recall a lot of guys coming back into the industry. So the average age of a geologist was like 60 years old or something like that, when 65 when I was coming in, and there was this like brain drain in it. Yep. And, and there was a ton of people that were geologists and were working geologists that had gone off, and a lot of them became teachers. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I was going to literally say yep. that, because I, I worked with another guy, Steve Conker. He was a teacher, too. He did that. Yeah. Um, but do you find that that teaching experience helped you to communicate? Because today you're probably recognized as the best communicator of geological ideas and making them simple and digestible for people. And, you know, do you think that that experience helped you there? It, it, it did. Yeah, I'm not going to pretend. Look, I, I loved working with the kids. Um, yeah. The first day I walked into that school, you know, I was terrified. I mean, you know, I've ne not got any teaching experience. I haven't stood up in front of a class. Yeah. I walked in, and there's this kid sitting, you know, right in the corner in, by the front door. It's a math class, seven 7.30 a.m. I looked down at this kid and I said, hmm, you look like you could be the next Bill Gates. That was my first encounter with a middle school student. And that kid went on to start a company um, about you know, 2014, so about 10 years after I, I taught him in middle school. He went through the School of Mines, got a PhD, and uh, started the company. I, I gave him the seed money to get started. His company is now worth a quarter billion dollars. He he. Is a metallurgist. He he makes uh, compounds for printing 3D, you know, metals. No way. Yep, yep, yep. But I, I got to know a lot of the kids there, and a lot of them, like I, several of them, became geologists. Some went to school of mines, and I've actually hired them. Some of them work for me. Some are engineers. It was it was a cool experience. Oh, so do but, you think do you think that you splashed an interest in geology? It is an interesting topic that I know in school I didn't learn. So I wasn't taught anything about geology other than geography class with little chapter or two that they I, had in I a would, textbook here and there. Like, it's not a topic we usually know. So you must have. I would drag the kids up. When they were in sixth grade, we had a geology curriculum. Like, there was about two or three months there where we had to teach geology. Cool. Of course, that, that I got into. You know, so um, Every fall, when the geology curriculum rolled around, I would ask Tom Hendricks, my first boss, I would say, you know, I got some kids, I want to bring them up to the mine. Can you host them? And he'd say, oh, yeah, yeah, bring them all up. So I'd take 48 sixth graders who hadn't seen a mine, hadn't seen a rock in their life, and they go underground. It's cool, man. Yeah. Cool. And then, what an experience for them, eh? <laughs> and, uh, one, the first year, uh, no, it was the second year, I think it was 9 11, it's right after 9 11. Yeah. And, um, you know, we went up to the mine, and Tom, he, he likes to give a presentation at the beginning. He talks to the kids and asks them questions and stuff. And and then if they answer a question right, he'll give them a rock or, you know, something. And we went through this half-hour presentation. And right at the end, he says, okay, everybody, anybody can answer this question gets to light the dynamite. And I looked at him and I said, Hank, you, you serious? He said, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have some fun today. I'm like, okay, I got 40, 48 sixth graders who are just looking at me like they're terrified, you know. But I remember he asked the question, this little kid named Gavin sticks his hand up. He was probably four foot tall, blonde kid, sticks his hand up and answers the question. It said, Tom. Tom says, you're going to like the dynamite later today. So we go through the whole, you know, tour underground and whatnot. And, you know, it's, it's getting late in the day. We're all, you know, it's starting to snow too. It's in the mountains and it's starting to snow. And uh, all the kids are starting to walk to the bus. They're getting cold. They want to get on the bus and get warm. And and Tom goes, hey, we haven't let the dynamite yet. And I was like, oh, come on. You're kidding me. Yeah, like young <laughs> so, Gavin is not going to be letting <laughs> one off today. So he goes back to the dry room, and he gets an old rubber boot. And 
Tom was actually a pretty good artist. He took a Sharpie and he drew a picture of Osama bin Laden on this boot. Can't it was a here. very, very nice picture of Osama bin Laden. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes and he gets a half a stick of dynamite out of the, out of the powder magazine, and blasting cap fuse, the whole works, and he you know, sets it all up and he drops it into this boot and there's this big wick hanging out of the boot, you know, almost like a bug of bunny curtain, this big wick sticking out. And he says, where's that kid? Where's that kid? And Gavin's like shaking his hand. He's terrified he's got to come and light this dynamite. So Tom gives him his cigarette lighter. Gavin comes up and he's, he's trying to hold this thing, you know, he's trying to, trying to do it, you know, yeah. flick it and it wouldn't come on. And so I go, I go up and help him and flick it and we, we light the dynamite. And Tom's standing there with his boot and it, you could see this fuse slowly burning, slowly burning up and it's going to go into the boot. He's talking the whole time about dynamite safety and blah, 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 blah. And the kids are just watching that fuse. When it goes in the boot, Tom takes the boot, and he wh whips it over the roof of the mine building into the settling pond in the back. And he keeps talking, and the kids are like, oh, this it was just a joke, you know. It was, uh, he was just, it's just a pulling, fuse pulling, or, their, yeah, pulling yeah. their leg. So they, they're cold, and they're walking to the bus. That boot went off. Ba -boom. And every kid in that tour was flat on the ground. They were prone, <laughs> prone on the ground. They were <laughs> screaming. <laughs> Did yeah. you get the parents? What happened? <laughs> Fortunately, it was back in the days when when people weren't quite as obsessed with uh, you know they weren't so sensitive. Uh, yeah, politically sensitive as, yeah, yeah, as yeah. today. So uh, it was taken with with good fun. That's crazy. Yeah. So, so when did you after after the the, the teaching uh, uh, chapter? Uh, what happens next? So, in in two thousand four, the gold price had started to tick up, and yep. you know I had been watching it, and my kids were were getting to the latter part of elementary school, and you know I could see I got to put three kids through college here soon, <laughs> and I got to get my skates back on. Yep. So I called up uh, my friend from graduate school. His name is Steve Turner. He was the chief geologist at Newma. And I called him up one afternoon in May. It was towards the end of the school year. And I said, Steve, I'm broke. I need a job. Okay, yeah. <laughs> he yeah. gave me a contract that afternoon. And uh, I went to work for Newmont. So I wow. worked at Newmont for probably the better part of four years. I ran exploration up in none of it. Um, some other stuff worldwide. Yep. And got back in the business. So I worked for Newmont up into 2007. And then um, a friend of mine said, oh, you know, mining, you know, traditional mining companies are not the place to be. You're not going to make any money. And I thought about it and I thought, you know, he's right. You know, when, when I went to graduate school, I was told, if you get a PhD, you, you, you can go into a major mining company, become a vice president, you know, have a good job, work on lots of projects worldwide. Yep. You know, there's organic growth in the mining companies at that point. Between BREEX, the gold price, and everything that happened over the, that 10 year interim from, say, 1996 to 2004, 5, 6, somewhere in there, the whole model broke down. You know, major mining companies had diminished their budgets, they cut their exploration staff. There wasn't an ability to, to work your way up. And so I thought about it and I thought, gee, you know, maybe he's right. I should go into junior mining. And um, I gave Newmont notice as soon as I got my bonus from Newmont. It was early March. I gave him notice and left the company, and I went to Vancouver the next day. Um, I joined a, a little company as vice president. It was a, it was Evolving Gold. I think it was called that when I first started. Yep. And, and, uh, uh, Rattlesnake, Rattlesnake Hill? Rattlesnake Hills was one of the projects. Yeah, yeah. I remember the company. So I, um, I met uh, some folks up in, uh, well, I met Craig Roberts and um, Cal Everett. At oh, yeah. Point. Yeah, and I gave them a presentation. They... They got money rounded up for me, uh, you know, like on that first day we rounded up. Oh, that's where you met Craig. That's how you, yes, okay, that's where I met Craig. Yep. Okay, cool. Yep. Okay, yeah, and Cal, yeah. Yep, so, right you know, on. I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, $3 million, that was more more budget than I had had at Newmont for the past, the last three years, you know, so. <laughs> this is going to be smokes. fun. This yeah. is good. <laughs> this is good. This is going to be fun. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's when I got That in. was a cool project, actually, the Rattlesnake Hill. It, it what was, was the hair on that in the end? It was like it, metallurgy It was or... partly geology, partly metallurgy. So the, the diatreme was vertical or near vertical. It yeah. was still intact. And um, it got deep quick. And because it was kind of down in the bottom of the bowl to begin with, um, you know, trying to push a, a pit in, in that kind of geometry wasn't wasn't looking like it, it, it would 
work in our favor. I'll tell you that. Was that an old Kinross project? It was mm. like, it, didn't it had some? It had uh, some sort of legacy to, or a so, affiliation with somebody. Well, uh, I think King and Resources had it for a while. Um, Newmont actually had a previous attempt to drill it. Okay. Back in the mm, 1990s, I think early 1990s. Right. Um, but uh, it had like seven holes when I first showed up, and all of them had hit long, low-grade intervals. But towards the bottom of the holes, it was actually starting to pick up the grade was. Uh -huh. And that was the thesis I had, is that maybe there's something more to this. So we we went in in um, 2007 or eight. Yeah, it was eight, because it was right before the GFC. And I remember we drilled that summer. We had an intercept, um, I think it was like 200 and some odd meters, of two point something gram. On, on the first day of the Denver Gold Forum in 2008, we announced that. We were trading at a dollar in the morning. Of course, that's the, that's the day of the crash. Uh, it was Lehman Brothers Day. So, oh. Yeah, everybody at the Denver Gold Forum was just looking at their, you know, their phones, watching their stocks and stuff. No, but it, it was a just, disaster. Everyone missed it. Everything just plummeted that day. I think we went from a dollar down to 45 cents by the end of the close, even on that drill result. It was crazy. I was thinking, mm, this isn't quite what I expected. But, uh, you know, but that said, coming back in 2009 when the price started to pick up, we started drilling again, and you know it, it was a, a nice ending. I mean, in terms of uh, return and some value, we went from I think a low of fourteen or fifteen cents up to a dollar eighty-five in the summer of two thousand nine, as as the market came back. And then and then when does the uh, the Gold Canyon chapter start? Because then that was yeah, Akiko. So I hadn't looked at Spring Pole in two thousand four or five when I was at Newmont. Yeah, and I really liked that that deposit. It was an alkaline gold system, which you know, most people in the Superior Province are like, there's no such thing. Or, you know, it's it was an oddball. Um, and I liked the project when I was at Newmont. I wrote a report. I said, this is going to be a 5 million ounce deposit. I I tried to push Newmont into chasing it. They had owned the project. Um, they had inherited the project from uh, Santa Fe Pacific Gold, mm. okay, uh, after they acquired Santa Fe. And... Only a little bit had been drilled off. But Newmont always took the attitude, you never look back. Okay, so given they had a history there, they didn't want to go back. All right, so they they opted not to. But when when I left Newmont and I joined Evolving, Akiko heard that I left. Uh, and she she tracked me down at a show. It was PDAC or some, one of these shows. Oh, because Akiko had it? Or yeah, Akiko, yeah, Akiko yeah. was the president and CEO of um, Gold King. Her, right. Her husband, Michael, had passed away in 2003, I think. And so she was running the company, Gold Canyon, for f five or six years. Uh, you know, when, when she came to me and asked if I could help, she said, do you remember how you like Spring Pool? I said, oh, Akiko, that's, you know, Akiko. She's very, you know, yeah. you cannot tell her no. No, no, for sure. <laughs> okay, so uh, she said, well, She's great. you remember how you like this? I said, yes, yes. She said, I really need your help here. I said, oh, okay, I'll. I'll try to figure something out. So um, I told the folks at Evolving I needed a little bit of time to work for Akiko. Nobody had a problem, you know, if I helped her. Uh, I called up Eric. Eric was actually, <clears throat> when when I first got out of the uh, out of Newmont and went, you know, Cal Everett and Greg introduced mm -hmm. me to Eric Sprott. He was the first person I marketed to. Really? Of Newmont. Yep. Wow. I was here in Toronto. It was um, March of... Uh, 2007, and they introduced me to Eric. We sat in that, you know, the gold building over here, um, 20, whatever, 27th floor or something. And um, Eric looked at me, he's like, who are you, where are you from? And I told him, I said, I just got out of Newmont. And then we ended up talking for like an hour and a half. And it was all about where I felt the gold mining industry should go. Like, you know, what assets were good, what assets weren't good. What Newmont should do, what Barrick should do, what like, how would the gold mining industry, you know, how should it go? It was just strategic talk, you know, just and it was it was exciting because Eric, uh, 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 you know, didn't even know who he was at that point. I was fresh out of Newmont, I had no sure. Idea. So you're having a <laughs> cordial conversation, yeah. with, You know, yeah, but, exactly. Well, we we built a good relation there. So when Gold yeah. Canyon came around, I called up Eric and I said, Eric, I really like this. I think it's a five million ouncer. Can you help us out? We need some money. He put in two million. We started drilling early 2010. 
first six holes were just home runs, and then it was you know a cascade of very very strong drilling after that. We got to five million ounces, just like I said. Yep. Yep. GCU was a big uh, big discovery, and yep. it was really uh, it was re- it made a mega splash. Yep. And uh, and then after that, you've been you know you've done Japan Gold. No. Oh, Irving. Irving, sorry. With Irving the Kiko. in Japan, right, with the Kiko. Yep. yep. And that was like a, that was an opening up of, of sort of Japan. It, it was a with reopening. Japan, Japan Gold sort of. was also there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, we ended up selling Spring Pole to uh, First, first Mining First Finance. Mining. Fund. Yeah, Akiko yeah, right. yeah. yeah. And um, Akiko really wanted to go explore in Japan. We had visited Hishikari, and I saw what how the industry was structured there. It was a really geared around s- smelter flux. Okay, so you, you didn't mine gold traditionally in millet, you know, like we do. You mine silica-rich rock that has gold in it. And right. The smelters buy it up for smelter flux. And um, it was a wonderful model. It was really eye-opening to see that. So we started Irving on the basis we could go out and find silica-rich, you know, vein material that we could sell as, as smelter flux. And, and funny enough, just a couple of days ago, We've started talks with JX Mining, which is the largest mining house in Japan, about building the Omu project into a smelter flux operation. So, oh, congratulations! It's cool. the first time. It's the first time a major Japanese mining house has it's decided. You know what? Coming back to Japan and, and trying to build new mines is is a good thing. So mm. we're very happy. Very happy. Yeah. Very cool. Nice yeah. to see that play out. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and what's the ticker of that now, Quentin? Do you know? Irving okay. is I R V. I R V. Yep. Okay, that's cool. So, so if, uh, if any of our listeners Certainly. think that's a very Certainly. compelling story, then have at it. You know. Yeah. Um, and so then you got you got you got you. Got, I mean, obviously, Quentin, you've had a, a tremendous ex- a, a history. Um, you got to brush shoulders with some of the most influential people and became a respected. A voice in their universes, um, and you have a very good ability to communicate, as I mentioned earlier, geological ideas and simplify them to, for people. And I think that's helpful. Um, and notwithstanding that, I think you have a good sense of 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 a project, a good project when you see it. We're not always right on these things. Yeah, you know that's it's still a, a check. Yeah. But I mean, you've got a, a, an interesting. Pro- I guess what do you I, look for? Yeah. Mm, that's a good question. Um, you know, look, the world's been explored by many, many people before us. You know, and good people. You know, mm-hmm. look at David Lowell. I mean, David went out and chased down a lot of the big, big winners. You know, back in the nineteen eighties, nineties, and you know, so a lot of the smart people have gone out and looked for deposits before you and I. But you know. We now have to go find that next generation. Um, it's not as easy, okay? Yep. Uh, a lot of the things I've looked at have been challenging. They proved to be challenging. Um, Novo was a, a good example. Uh, I, To this day, you know, I have no doubt that those conglomerate beds have uh, a vast amount of gold. Uh, but, boy, trying to advance them and trying to figure out how to mine them with not quite knowing where the grade is and, and what the grade is, you know, where it is and what it is 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 a, a challenge and when you dilute it it you know it's a challenge but um yeah look i think at a fundamental level here's the things i look for um the the what whatever project that comes my way you know like what i'm doing right now working with crescat for example is a, you know helping identify investment opportunities i look for projects that that have all the hallmarks of a world class you know size uh, d- deposit opportunity yeah, the company has to have a land package that covers the entire thing. I don't like to see these companies where they have little bits and pieces of land. You, you know, me both. Yeah, they drive me nuts. I mean, that it's yeah. just a distraction. If a company, you know, and a project is whole, whole like it, you know, you, you have a, a target you can test that that could be a, a game changer, a world class, you know, opportunity. Then I'm I'm in. Now, how do you identify this? Well. Look, it comes from experience with a lot of different ore bodies. You know, fortunately, studying under Dick Hutchinson and others, I learned a lot about everything from VMS systems to porphyries to, you know, epithermal systems. You fill in the blank, everything. 
And it's getting to know and going to those mines uh, over and over again, field trips, field trips, and learning, you know, here's the size of the price. You know, you, you get a sense, hmm, there's the scale of the thing. Here's the grades of it. These are the right elements that we're looking for in terms of uh, its geology. You know, um, if you, in, you, you have to be able to think in 3D as well. You know, you've got to think about the third dimension into the ground. Uh, but I, I just, you know, I, I have like this little mental ruler going in my head every time somebody puts a map in front of me. I look at it and I say, hmm, is that the scale of target that, that would be of interest? Is it something that's going to be big? Uh, Newfound. Um, look, you know, I was fortunate to help Eric Sprott at Kirkland. Or, well, at Fosterville. At, at, sorry, at Fosterville, um, you know, through Newmarket at, at the beginning, but ultimately Kirkland. And, I, you know, truly I don't think we've seen any orogenic deposit like that in modern history. Like just an incredible uh, system. It's the kind of thing you learn about in, in university. But until you see it firsthand, it, it, you don't quite realize what, what it is. But when I went to Fosterville, well, Eric, I was in Australia, I was in Perth, and I, I'd done work for Eric now and again just because he had helped me so much. I you know, felt obliged to help him. And he called me one day in Perth. He said, I really need you to go over and look at this Fosterville deposit. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I had seen the news releases that Newmarket had with a few high-grade intercepts, and they were interesting, but I was very doubtful. You know, like I was thinking, oh, they just happened to get lucky. You know, hit a yeah, little pot, tagged pot in a of high of pods, yeah. But when I got there and, and went underground, of course, the guys at the mine are like, who is this guy? And, you know, mm -hmm. they didn't know who Eric Sprott was even. You know, they're like, this Canadian guy is sending this American guy to look at this mine. And they weren't quite sure what to do with me, but they took me underground. And they were very cordial and nice. But um, but when I got underground and saw the high grade, they had opened up. It clicked. I mean, it was unbelievable. It was like something out of a textbook. Okay, you, usually in an orogenic system, they form deep. You don't see open space vugs like cavities that are lined with crystals. There were vugs all over the place. There was visible gold all over the place. It almost looked like an epithermal vein. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but those are the kind of the things you you think, geez, that's a high-level orogenic system. It's an epizonal system, what we call epizonal. Usually these are eroded away. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like they're, they they get washed away. You know, yeah, in the Archean rocks, I mean, we're looking at the mesozone or mesothermal it, Exactly, you're way down, down. You're down yeah. deep. And so to see this, it just, it was like the Holy Grail. It's like, oh, my gosh. I remember getting out of that mine. I went straight to my hotel, wrote a, like a five-page report for Eric and this thing's going to be bigger than Ben Hur. You know, they they need to drill down dip on this thing. You know, it was plunging, uh, yeah, like 20, 25 degrees I think to the south. And I I told Eric they should drill a hole way down here, eight hundred meters down plunge, just to give it a go, and and see because I think they're at the top of an iceberg. It's a big system. Eric actually pushed um, Doug Forster into drilling that hole, so they drilled it. It was, that was, um, so I, I wrote the report in May, and then I got this call from Doug Forster in June. Like, he didn't know who I was. He said, I want to get to know you. Uh, so he said, can you come to Vancouver? I went up there and I, met, I had lunch with Doug, and he's like asking me, you know, 20 questions. Right? Like, what did you see when you went there? What who's did you think? What you think <laughs> no, he's on? trying yeah. to figure out who I am, and it's like, I don't know this guy. Yeah. Anyway, he didn't tell me they were drilling that hole, but they, were, they had started drilling it in June. Okay, and they'd continued drilling into early August. Well, towards the end of July, I got this call from a banker at RVC and said, there's a company that would like to take over a new market. We understand you know something about the deposit. Could you help us write the due diligence report? I was like, mm, yeah. And I said, who is it? He said, we can't tell you. <laughs> so I flew over to Melbourne. Got off the plane, and Tony Makucha standing at the baggage carousel. I'm like, oh, duh, okay. Uh, now That's I see what's, what's going, going on here. Yeah. So anyway, um, you know, we, we went up to the mine, and um, we, we went underground. I showed Tony all the stuff that I had seen a few months earlier, you know, high grade. This is the tip of the iceberg, you know, kind of stuff. And, you know, it was exciting to see. There was a lot of visible gold. Was there. Tony excited about it? He, he was 
quite excited, but also, you know, skeptical and rightly so. I mean, it's very unusual to find something like this, okay? But, but Tony was excited. And uh, anyway, we came out of the mine and we had lunch and then some geologist comes up to me, he says, we drilled your hole. And I said, what do you mean you drilled my hole? And he said, well, that hole that you told Eric, we drilled, we drilled. Would you like to come see it? So I said, heck yeah, let's go out and, you know, let's have a look at this core. And we went out cool. uh, to, <laughs> to the core yard and this thing's laying on the ground, you know, and I'm looking at my notes and I'm thinking, okay, they should have hit something at, what, you know, whatever meter, 600 meters down, right? Yeah. So I'm running through the boxes and then I, I see this stretch about five or six boxes where there's just quartz meaning, like going every which way, you know, quartz. And I thought, I'm going to walk up and I'm going to see visible gold all over the place. This is going to be a, a killer, right? And I walk up to this core. Tony's standing right next to me. And we look at this core, and we didn't see any visible gold. Now, there was sulfides and stuff, you know. Yeah, some in, salts indicators. and all that, yeah. And I looked, and I said, I don't see any visible gold, Tony. He, now Tony's kind of panicking a little bit. You know, he's like, well, how do we justify doing a deal like this, right? And I'm like, mm. I said, Tony, look, I think, I think they're really close to something here. I wouldn't, I wouldn't discount this. You know, there's a lot of quartz meaning. There's a lot of the right bells and whistles. I think they're close, but they're not quite there. Anyway, uh, we went back to North America. I wrote the report, and the last line in my report. See, I'm from Denver, so um, I said, uh, you know, here in Denver, um, everybody, you know, knows the. Broncos won the Super Bowl, but nobody remembers what they paid Peyton Manning. Okay, in other words, you know, nobody cares. Because I, I wanted to convey the message that they should go ahead and do this deal. You know, Kirkland should go ahead and buy a new market, just hold hold their nose, because on the bet there's something there. And anyway, they did, you know, we know that the history. They they did the deal. Okay, well, that hole turned out to be ten meters from the, the swan zone. If you put it in the computer and look at where it was. It was, it was ten, right there. 10 meters away from the swan zone. And it was actually a wedge hole or something off of that, you know, soon after they actually hit the swan zone. So it wow. turned out really well. Okay, but what the takeaway, to answer your question, that was 20 minutes ago, sorry, I'm blathering on. Um, the, the point is you have to know the system really well. You, know, you got to know, look at those rocks and say, yep, I'm at the tippy top of an epizonal system, and there's a lot of runway below me, things like that. And when you, you guys showed me those first core holes from... Um, I remember what I, I showed you. I was oh, at... I remember I gosh. had a Pelican case, and I, and I met you at uh, in Vancouver. Yeah, I remember. I, you know, it was like lightning strike. It was like a little twice. secret meeting we had Holy behind the booth. Cow. I was like, come on back here. I'm going to show you something cool at the Gold Spot booth. <laughs> and same thing, you know, the buggy quartz and, and the antimony self assaults and that, and yeah. that, all the bells and whistles. And it's like, man, you guys, you're on it here. Well, see, so so for me, like, so when, we, when we drilled that, I mean, it was crazy, right? It was wild and, you know, beyond our wildest imaginations yeah. of what yeah. it could have been, you yeah. know? Yeah. And to, to start there, I knew it was in an organic system. Mm -hmm. yep. And what you did was... You, you you defragged my mental computer because I had no concept of epizonal regimes. I had no I, I didn't know those textures. And so when we when we drilled through, I mean I'm an Archean organic guy yeah. more than anything. Yeah. That's my largely the bulk of my experience. I'd say for probably 15 years of Archean mm -hmm. organic geology. And so um so so for me looking at that stuff, I mean those are 500 million year old rocks, not, you know, Two point, you know, seven billion year old rocks or two point nine billion year old rocks to start, and um, and then when we're drilling through what appeared to be, you know, bull quartz. I mean, this was just milky white. Yep. If it was yep. anywhere else, and I and I wouldn't and I wasn't thinking, mm -hmm. I would have pitched that R shit in the dumpster. Run away. Run oh, away. that's dumpster <laughs> core. That's like you know shales and and yeah. milky white veins, and to like just meters upon meter box after box after box of visible gold and craziness mm -hmm. and but it was buggy and there was all these kind of crustiformy textures too to it that coliformy crustiformy stuff that makes you think because i had seen a lot of a lot of rocks with pine tree and 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 in those days and so lots of site trips and lots of mm -hmm. you know a, a vast variety of, of, of various 
deposit styles. And so to me, this was screaming epithermal. And I was like, well, why am I seeing epithermal textures in what I know to be an orogenic belt? The entire concept of that land package, the entire, all my staking, mm -hmm. years of work leading up to this, everything was pointing to burn an orogenic belt here, but why am I seeing these types of textures? And what was interesting about that is that when you said that with the epizonal and then we looked at the, you know, and, uh, you know, t t to be fair, Greg had also um, that fall, I want to say no like November, December, Greg was also wise to the Fosterville analog because we okay. knew of the Bendigo, yeah. the, like yeah. in terms of the districts, we knew of the Bendigo analog, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like the, the Victoria Goldfields versus. Yeah. And, and so Greg was already kind of onto that, but we weren't onto the epizonal mm. aspects of it. Yeah. But he had already seen visual similarities between Foster Rail's core. And so, but that was really, really compelling when you said that. And what's interesting about that is it gives you conviction too, as you said, because you know you're the tippy top of something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's an organic deposit. It's not an epithermal deposit. It's not going to disappear on you. Mm -hmm. It goes to the bowels of the earth. Exactly. It's yep. going to be there. Yep. It, they always are, yep. you know. And, and... And if you know that, then you have to sort of treat it a different way. Now, interesting thing, though, with those types of grades, I think you, you, you picked up on a thing, which is like deposits like this, whether it be Fosterville, um, you know, high-grade deposits of this nature, like you said, they're like textbook-type things. Mm -hmm. And we learn about them. But for some reason, there's a pragmatism about us all. Do you think that has to do with the regulatory environment, you think that has to do with um, the conservatism that we ten typically tend to bake into the variability of, of deposits in general, that we don't know what to make of it, but whenever we see it, when you're there and you touch it and you feel it, like I was in Red Lake Dickinson, I used to work at Red Lake mm -hmm. Dickinson, Mikasa, I, I mean, in Kirkland, like I was in some of the highest grade gold mines in the world, and I have seen the, probably the richest fl faces in the world, short of Fosterville, um, and muck pile sampling them. I'd never seen, I mean, I've seen rock like this, yeah. like of this ilk in this grade. But when you see it over such a big footprint and you huge, see, huge, yeah. and you just like, you touch it, you, like, you know, like it's, it's, you almost get a gold fever about it. You go, this is different. This is crazy. It, it is different. Um, you know, you got to think in terms of that, that 3d, 3d aspect and you touched on it. <clears throat> okay. So you guys have, have about six or seven kilometers, I think, right now, of uh, strike that you've tested at the north end of the Appleton Fault Corridor. Mm -hmm. And you're hitting high-grade veins, you know, all over the place, both on the east side and the west side and, you know, at depth. But you think about it, it, it would not make sense for a system that we know geologically those fluids are derived 20 kilometers in the ground, okay? It would not make sense for those fluids to go all the way up to the surface of the earth and just deposit a thin little strip in the six, top 250 yeah, meters. Top 200 <laughs> meters of, of Earth's crust. Okay, yeah, that no. doesn't make any sense. Okay, no. so yeah, like that's why. Well, that's what Eric understands too. I mean, based on the experience of Fossilville, is that that thing's going to go down in the ground for for who knows how long. Uh, I mean, it could go down kilometers. You know, to be frank, it it's, it already is down. In a you're at the tippy yeah. top. You're at the top of an epizonal system, right? So. You got a lot of runway below you. It's six kilometers long strike, so it makes sense that yeah, it's going to go down on the ground kilometers too. Now, you know, the question then becomes: Well, you you can't drill off something that big, you know, but you, you kind of tackle the near surface stuff and then get to a point where it's like, okay, we got what we need to build a mine, and then 50 years from now, after we're all gone, people will still be mining. You know, that's, it's a generational deposit. It's a company maker. It's a generational deposit that'll keep on going for who knows how long. That's my feeling, too. I know I can't say those things because... I can. You can. Um, but my feeling is that it's something... And you know what's interesting, too, is I've been looking at other uh, deposits. And I had a great conversation uh, with uh, Sean Hood, of all people. Uh, uh, at ALS at Goldspot. So Sean mm -hmm. used to run Goldspot, uh, where he still runs Goldspot, I guess. Uh, but he's just leading it up with uh, ALS now. And uh, Sean's a, a brilliant geologist and and, uh, and and just a great guy all around. And, and, you know, him and I, early days, were talking about some of this stuff. And, you know, the oddity is, 
if you look at orogenic deposits of that size and scale, mm -hmm. whether you're in the Abitibi or whether you're in, you know, pick your poison. Yogurn. You yeah. don't you don't drill them off first. They almost ne never like because most of those things. A we haven't seen them in a really long time, mm -hmm. right? Because you know, in the Abitibi, for instance, those were put into production many years ago and are still producing to this day. Many of them. Look at the dome mine. Yeah, yeah exactly. But but you didn't like they don't drill off. Let's say I'm just going to make up numbers just to caveat this, and this is not in any way, shape, or form estimating. I'm not conveying sure. forward-looking statement yeah. disclaimer, etc. Let's take the, for example, the Karatazin mine. Karatazin mine is 11 million ounces of gold, mm -hmm. right? I think in the end, 11, 12 million ounces of gold yep. in Kirk Lake. Yep. There's 47 million ounces of orogenic gold in Kirk Lake between the Quebec border and Swastika, mm -hmm. basically, or let's say, uh, um, um, oh, uh, Alamos thing. Oh, I, uh, uh, young, I Davis, young Davidson. Young, young Davidson. Yeah, Young Davidson and Quebec border. is 47 million ounces of gold there. Mm hmm the Crowdison's 11 to 12 million ounces. They didn't drill off 11 to 12 million ounces of gold and say, okay, it's time to make a production decision, let's go. They drilled off like a million and then, or less, probably hundreds of thousands of ounces of gold, mm -hmm. maximum. And a production decision was made and for the following 60 years, mm -hmm. the rest of it was found. Yes, like, this, is, this is a very important uh discussion that needs to be have had in light of where we're at today uh -huh. because we've lost our way in my view in the mining space i'm not trying to throw criticism at anybody but i i think with the advent of 40 ni-43 101 and the advent of we'll call it these you know mega engineering firms who tend to optimize projects uh which often leads to blown out scale okay yeah um, and blown like, out capital too, and and capital costs. Yeah, and, we've lost sight of the fact that you can find a deposit, and you don't have to to drill the whole thing out before you can start mining. Okay, back in the old days, um, like when I worked at Homestake or Newcrest, where the mandate was find a million ounces, and yeah. even if even if there's plenty more there, and you know it, you know it's oh it's open there, it's open there. You worry about the million ounces you found and try to build a mine because if, once you get a mine going that thing produces the cash you need to, to find the more, more and more and more, you know, and, and they grow. Mines grow organically if you let them. Okay, we've lost sight of that. We think we have to drill things ad nauseum many times. And there's a point at which you just say, this system's huge, we know it is. You know, we're going to build a mine around what we got here. And you, you find a landing spot where that, that will work, that will, you know, the economics are such that you can justify capitalizing building a mine. Yep. And you get on with it. Because if you do, you'll be more rewarded in the end. Because if you have a mine, it's cash flowing. You don't have to go to market, you know, and raise money and, and stuff. And, you know, that, that is one of the biggest issues we had, say, in the last gold cycle in the 2000s and 2000, early 2000 teens, was that there were a lot of these projects where um, companies you know, they they just kept drilling and drilling and drilling and drilling. You know, it, it, and there's a point at which you just got to say, okay, we're going to build a mine, and that's going to be much more economic, economically efficient and result in less dilution for a company. Do you think the major companies are broken with their models to produce ounces yes. rather than money? The okay, profits? I'm, I'm actually glad that um, the, the major miners went through a period in the 2000s where size was pretty much what dictated, you know, where they wanted to land. Like Newmont and Barrick were- 300 to 500,000 ounces a year production well, profile. or company-wide, they yeah. needed, oh, we gotta be seven, right? Seven and a half. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they wanted growth, size, size, size. Um, they took on a lot of debt to develop new projects. They also picked up a lot of projects that were, you know, kind of half-baked or not, not really all that economic. Um, but there was a lot of a uh, lot of focus around building size to get you know to attract a market premium. And when they took on all that debt to build those mines, a lot of those mines, um, it didn't go well because mm -hmm. when gold fell off in 2013, you know these companies like Barrick and so they were strapped with a lot of debt and it was painful. Okay, now they they've learned the ways. I mean, gold miners usually 
uh, learn their lesson. It, does, it takes them maybe a year or two to kind of, you know, turn the ship around and start heading in the right direction. And, and they did manage in the 2000 teens to get the pri the costs down. Okay, they, you know, as the gold price was soft, they got their costs back down. Yeah, to like the 900. Yeah, range exactly. And 900. Yeah. They, they, they got it down there. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it was out of necessity. They had to, and they also had to service that debt. Unfortunately, you know, most of them did pay off that debt. They, a lot of them had to sell their assets to, to pay off debt. But, um, you know, what's the focus today? Well, fortunately, most of the gold mining companies aren't deeply in debt, but I would argue there's, there's a lack of vision, okay? Um, today, we have gold miners who almost universally have boards that are comprised of non-technical people, non-visionaries. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we, we see them focusing on other aspects of the business to attract investors that are not really traditionally sustainable in, in gold mining. Okay, uh, dividends, you know, that's the flavor of the day. They want to attract investors by issuing big dividends. Mm -hmm. We cannot support big dividends in the gold mining industry. Okay, if we do, if we look, I'm not saying no dividends. I'm just saying, you know, keep it real. It's okay. a business that has enough volatility in it baked into it. If you've ever tried to run a mine, exactly. you have some great days and then something shitty happens and you have a really bad time. Exactly. You, gotta, and you need to bank, you need that bankroll mm -hmm. to be able to tough keep, through that. Keep that cash, but also you need that cash so you can grow. Okay. Oh, totally. You got to have a future. And if you're, you know, if you're, Send writing checks to everybody who's a shareholder and the money's going out the door. You don't have the money to build that next generation of mines. And that's where we're at right now. If we don't see these companies turn around that that trend, stop, you know, reduce dividends, but start using that cash to buy assets, build new mines, I don't know what's going to happen here. I truly don't. And, you know, what's worse is we don't even have the people to, to run these things anymore either because, you know, people... You know, young people aren't going into this industry. So it's a strange, it's a, it's sort of a strange um, uh, mandate for me. It seems because there's like the when we're talking large caps, I mean the the, the you know the Ignicos, the Newmonts, the Barracks, etc. The formula seems to be get as much liquidity as humanly possible, be the be the lightning rod for capital for large head funds, ETFs, everybody else, pension funds, things like that. To be able to buy and 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 play, that's that that that, um, that you you want to be the way to play, the space. And in order to do that, you need to have. I guess traditionally you had to have at least a ton of size in terms of total ounce production. So there was a leverage, there was a leverage baked into that formula there. And so that's when they stopped really focusing on returns and focusing more on exposure. Because it was like a long-term exposure mm -hmm. to your your leverage to gold prices, you're not necessarily, you know, worried about making money. Mm -hmm. You just want to be a leverage, as big as a leverage play as possible, and secure as much liquidity as possible to seize yeah. the largest, you know, market cap, etc. And then to your point, um, you conflate that issue with with um, with profit, with, uh, with 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 things like like parlor tricks almost. Uh, like dividends, which make it more attractive for these funds and these ETFs to own because it's dividend. It's a dividend yielding, you know, uh, mm -hmm. instrument. I just don't see the benefit. Like I see the benefit to shareholders. I don't see the benefit to the corporation. And I think, I don't think in this instance where the major companies are today, that shareholders' interests and company interests are aligned. Nope. I don't think they're in alignment. And oftentimes, you run a business really well. Your shareholders do very well. Everyone's in alignment. But I think the responsibility of the boards, the responsibility of those management teams is to be making decisions that's in the best interest for the company and not necessarily the shareholders. Mm -hmm. And that sounds very strange, but that's actually proper corporate governance. Yeah, they've gone off into the weeds in several cases. Um, you know, I don't want to disparage... Uh, you know, because of political correctness. I can't no, fair enough. Yeah, we don't have those to. rabbit holes. Yeah. But, um, Look, the fact of the matter is, um, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you could get onto the website of any major gold mining company, and the first thing you see there is a link to their operations and their metrics and, you know, about the reserves and resources and making money and, you know, costs and da, 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 all the good stuff that 
we need to see as a mining industry. Now you get on these websites, and it takes you 20 minutes to even find that information because there's all these other layers of stuff. Yeah, there's trees and solar panels and, and you know. It's a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's pretty wild. Yeah. It, it's, hard to, it's hard to dig through it all. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, Quentin, I, I, I think this has been a fabulous chat. I hate to wrap it up because I think we're just getting going. But uh, it's been it's fun. We'll have to have you back and uh, do this again. Enjoy um, it. I have a million questions. We could get into a million things, but we I, knocked you know, a few. We saw a few. We, yeah, yeah. Well, this is uh, part one of a part two, and at some point we'll we'll have to come back and do part two. And but it was great, man. It's it's been uh, you've been a tremendous uh, uh, help to me thanks in my career, me. and and uh, thanks for coming and having and doing this. Enjoyed it. Thank Cheers. you very much, Cindy. Take care. Take care.